Hello. Today we're going to be looking at these cellular genes called oncogenes. And we're going, to, we're going to be looking at the effect these genes have in tumor formation and progression. Okay, so in the last lecture we were looking at the, um, some of the changes that occur in cells during tumor formation. So we looked at tumor development over time, we looked at um, this idea of the multi-hit hypothesis of tumor formation, meaning that there's um, a series of genetic changes that have to occur in a population of cells for them to progress towards cancer. And we looked at some of the broader characteristics of this, you know, looking at it at, at a cellular level, looking at the phenotypes of the cells and looking at a succession of phenotypes. And then we looked at a, a, a particular cancer such as um, colorectal cancer and we looked at the formation of these polyps and we looked at the development of cancer. Okay, so what we're going to be doing now is start to focus on some of the actual um, genes or proteins within a cell that are perturbed in cancer. And there are two broad categories of genes that we're going to discuss. In this lecture we're going to be discussing cellular oncogenes and in the following lecture, we're going to discuss tumor suppressor um, proteins or tumor suppressor genes. Okay, so this lecture is looking at the first category of um, factors that are um, perturbed in cancer cells, and these are cellular oncogenes. So to begin this story, we're kind of winding back the clock to look at what cell biologists knew and understood in the 1970s, okay, and then we'll look um, at how the story unfolded and how they started to identify what was actually happening in these cancer cells. So, in the um, in the 1970s, people had identified um, these viruses, these either DNA or RNA um, viruses, and people were in in various model organisms and various you know um, other animals they were they were thinking there was a strong link between the occurrence of these viruses and the um, development of of tumors so initially it was thought that this might be a widespread phenomena for many types of cancers okay so you've got to understand that people had no understanding of how cancers formed okay there was no understanding and then you know, so following on from this multi-hit hypothesis and this succession of phenotypes, people were trying to understand what's actually happening in cells. So the, the first bunch of ideas was that, well, maybe tumor viruses are causing these different types of cancers. Okay, so it was thought that the viruses that occurred commonly within a human population um, may be um, infecting cells and making them susceptible to being transformed into a, into tumor cells. Okay. Um, whilst the you know there was good evidence to suggest maybe this was happening, there was also some really clear evidence that indicated well it doesn't sound like viruses are to blame for for most cancers. So most types of cancers clearly don't spread from one person to another like an infectious disease. Okay. Um, and also, if viruses were causing widespread tumor formation for you know many cancer types, then clearly you'd see epidemics of viruses as you see flu epidemics. You know you'd see waves of of cancer passing through the population, which you don't see, and you'd see clusters of um, of you know in areas where you'd have clusters of a particular cancer breaking out and. You know, there was a little bit of evidence that maybe sometimes this was being observed, but generally it wasn't the case. Okay, um, so so despite the early ideas that maybe viruses were causing widespread cancers, well, maybe that wasn't the case. Now, there are um, let me just jump a slide here. That there are instances where viruses do play an important role in cancer formation. And one of the most obvious ones is is cervical cancer. Okay, so I think we all um, understand that the human papilloma virus um, plays an important part in a particular cancer formation, which is cervical cancer. And the mechanism of how the viral 
proteins interact with cellular proteins is clearly understood at a molecular level and we have a really good understanding of what causes cervical cancer. Okay, And I'll probably talk about this in later lectures. But, but generally viruses don't cause all these other cancer types. Okay, so this is the exception that proves the rule in, in, in some ways. Okay, so, so as we were saying, typically um, we don't see the characteristics of you know, vi viruses spreading and, and causing cancers in, in clusters and in, in waves. So, um, so, so a lot of the attempts undertaken during the 1970s when these ideas were, were fervent, um, um, it proved unsuccessful to identify viral sequences and viral you know, you know, activity in these cancer cells. So from the hundreds of different tumors that were studied and encountered in, um, in, in cancer clinics, the, there were only two um, clear examples where a virus was identified as causing the, 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 the tumor. And like I said, we had cervical cancer and liver cancer being the two exceptions. So, um, so, so from, from these examples where viruses were involved, people were looking at the sequences of the viral genomes and identifying key protein in the viral genome that was perturbing cell biology. So there was something in the genome of these viruses that was driving a, a cellular process. So people started to identify these, characterize these, sequence these, express them, and, and do experiments with these sequences. Um, so initially it was thought, like I said, maybe viral sequences were causing cancers. But when people looked a bit more deeply, it turned out that the sequences in the viruses were actually human gene sequences that had been picked up by the virus. Okay, And then they were just being inexperienced they're being expressed inappropriately um, and at inappropriate levels, in inappropriate times and in a, inappropriate levels. So it turns out that this, the cellular genome of human cells is actually the source of these genes that drive cancer. Okay, And um, so we all know that this, the cellular genome of human cells has thousands of genes. Um, estimates are, I, I'm not sure what the current estimates are, but 35 to 40,000 genes um, within the, the human genome and and many of these are involved in or are identified as being perturbed in cancer cells. So we have a rich population of genes in our cells and many of these genes can be perturbed and lead to um, cells losing their growth regulation effectively. So we've, we've now built up a large catalogue of these cancer causing genes which are um, a natural part of the cellular genome, but these natural genes get mutated and perturbed to, and it redefines these genes as cancer-causing genes. Okay, so these are genes that have a normal cellular function and they act normally and they're an important part of cell biology, but when they get mutated, they then become these cancer-causing genes. Okay, and these, these genes are referred to as either oncogenes, which is what we're talking about today, or they can be um, characterized as tumor suppressor genes, and we'll talk about them in a few weeks. So we know that the human genome contains tens of thousands of genes, and that some of these can be perturbed and play a role in cancer. If you look at the human genome, the, only a small percentage of the entire genome is actually coding sequences and you know promoter regions and all of that an awful lot of the human genome is made up of these sort of relics of of um of viral infections that, that occurred over evolution so if you look at a lot of the the human genome sequence you can identify sequences which have high similarity to viral genomes and there's many thousands of these copies because over many millions of years we've picked up repeated infections from viruses that have been integrated into our genome and then they've been mutated and become these obsolete bits of DNA that do nothing. They just, they, they just make up a large quantity of, of, of the genome. 
So uh, uh, approximately 8% of the human genome has been built up by acquiring these retroviral genomes over time, and then they've been sort of, that they've lost their function. So, um, so with this, there's over 40,000 sort of segments of the genome that can be characterized as being um, from viral genomes. But like I said, they have no role in modern day cancer because these sequences have just lost their function and, and are considered to be inactive.